Well, hello everyone. I hope this finds you abounding in God's grace and abiding in the love of our Lord. Here I am once more. Just wanted to let you know that is I. And let me welcome you here with the chalkboard. Let's see if let's see if I can get this here. There we go. Okay, and I hope you have a delicious, well, you know the routine, carbonated, artificially sweetened, and uh, chemically laced carbonated beverage at hand. That's, uh, that's what I would prefer. Maybe diet sun-kissed orange. But to whatever you've got, let's, uh, let's go ahead. This should be a fairly short class. I apologize that I did not feel well and didn't get the class up. Yesterday I was all ready to record it basically and then just got um, uh, really one of my episodes where I got wiped out and I'm feeling much better today. So let's proceed. We're going to finish the themes and theology section from Mark's Gospel here so that we can set up to move on to Christology next time. And of course, as I've said more than once before, Christology is theology. It um, would go under the category of, uh, or the heading of theology, but I'm treating it, as you know, in, uh, in these Gospels as a separate category, and I think that's a helpful division to make, but let's summarize what we've covered so we can add one more point under this heading of themes in theology. You remember we looked at the motif of, uh, of mystery or the secrecy theme in Mark's Gospel, the failure of the disciples, that motif of misunderstanding. And then also we showed how these sort of come together when you see the teaching of Christ that's emphasized in Mark on the meaning of true discipleship, which is to be understood in terms of suffering and in terms of Christ's example of suffering on the cross, a willingness to do God's will uh, at all costs, even, uh, even if we must suffer. Well, to that, let's add another. I'd like to talk as well about the reign of God or the kingdom of God in Mark's gospel. And I'm going to explain why I'm using this term reign here in a moment. Now, of course, Matthew and Luke do show Jesus speaking often about the kingdom of God. It's, it rarely is mentioned in John's gospel. Just when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, you remember when he says you need to be born anew or born from above in order to see the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And then later when Jesus is before Pilate in John 18 when he says, uh, that's from, from John 3 and verses 1 through 5, but later in John 18, 36 when Jesus tells Pilate, my, my kingdom is not of this world. So you have that other reference to where he uses the word kingdom there several times. So it's really not a theme. It's expressed differently. The same idea is in John, I think, expressed more in terms of life or eternal life and things related to that. In Matthew and Luke, yes, there is a great deal discussed about the kingdom of God, but we're going to see the unique emphasis that we find on it in Mark's gospel, and it certainly is a theme that dominates his gospel. And remember that Mark is writing first, so even though there are some unique references in Matthew and Luke, that you find only there, much of what they're saying about Jesus' teaching, much of what they're recording from Christ about the kingdom is they're apparently taking from Mark. Now, when we come to Mark and when we come to the Gospels in general, and the New Testament for that matter, we need to understand that the kingdom of God, this idea of God's kingdom is being addressed against the background 
of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Hebrew Scriptures that we refer to as the Old Testament. And so we need to have some idea of how that term is used in the Old Testament. We're not going to study that except just to point out here that it's not, in the Old Testament, it's not a static term as uh, we maybe often use it in the church today. It's a, it's a dynamic term, uh, term rather, and that, that means it, uh, it has life, it is elastic, it, it's broad, it's, well, another way to say it is it's, it's multi-dimensional in the Old Testament or multi-referential, referential, <laughs> it can refer to more than one thing. I should just start this slide over, but I, 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 I don't want to. Um, but it, uh, it's not limited to a single idea necessarily or um, just to, to a, a single usage. Keep that in mind, that it's, uh, it, is a, it does have a core concept to it that we're going to see right now, but that it can refer to more than one thing or it can be very broad in what it's embracing and what it's encompassing. And here, here's what I mean. God's kingdom in the Old Testament, it, it could refer to a realm like the um, nation of Israel uh, or of some realm like uh, the, the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. You know, that idea of it being a certain people or a certain place, okay, well that can carry over to some extent perhaps in certain references to God's kingdom, but typically it's more the idea of his God's reign, God's reign or rule. So maybe think of it as uh, God's sovereign rule or authority over the whole cosmos where you think of God's kingdom. And we're not going to give passages here. There are many that we could cite. But simply giving you sort of a broad sketch of how we would find the term used in the Old Testament, either of God's sovereign rule or authority over everything, over everything, or more and maybe a more individualized or particularized, a particular, hello, <laughs> a particular sense, uh, oh, his rule over God's, over the lives of individual people. I'm sorry, I'm struggling here, but I don't want to go back. Normally, I would go back and keep re-recording this segment over and over, but I'm <laughs> going to let that go. But you know, in Jesus' day, the, the apocalyptic Judaism of the time in which Jesus lived recognized that you had the, the present reality of this idea of God's rule or his authority was both a, a present reality, but the, the emphasis with them was on the, what's called the eschatological or future dimension of the rule of God, where, the, where often as the people suffered, as the people were persecuted, they would look forward to the time when God would intervene, where God would step into human history, where he would intervene in the affairs of men and, and what we might call uh, actualize his reign to establish his rule, his kingdom here on earth. So there is this this emphasis in the Old Testament of the coming kingdom, of the coming time when God is going to reign and establish his rule in a special way here in this world. And it's with that in view that we come to Jesus then saying in Mark that now that time has come and the kingdom of God is at hand. We see that Matthew shows Jesus making this announcement, right? You can see it over here in, in the text we've got on the left here in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus then went into Galilee, and then from that time he began to preach, repent for the kingdom. And in Matthew, we, we pointed out, he typically will 
will change it to heaven, the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So there's that idea that it's at hand. But notice in Mark, we're going to see how that is linked to the whole meaning of the gospel or the good news, right? So we come over to Mark and look in, in Mark chapter 1 when he begins, he calls what he is recording. You remember he tells us, he is, he is telling us that this whole record that follows is about the good news. And then it's, it's the beginning of the good news. And then he links that to when he talks about down here in verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Notice though here, and he says the same thing, repent. But notice twice we have these references to the gospel here. Verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. What was he doing when he did this? He was proclaiming the gospel of God saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel, the gospel, right? So you see that where um, three times in the opening verses of John's record here, he says the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. So he's linking this idea of the, the kingdom being near with that's the good news. That's the gospel, that's at the heart of what he is talking about when he is talking about the gospel. And for your, for your reference here, I've included this from Powell's work, um, The Fortress Publisher's Introduction to the Gospels, and I've referred to it often as one of my sources. And, and I've included these typically as separate files that I upload to the Google Drive, but I can just insert it here and I'll include it in the file that I upload of these boards here. But uh, just, we're not going to go through them all, but notice there are a couple that are unique to Mark. But we just noticed chapter, chapter 1 and verse 15. So you see that uh, there. And then here is a reference that's unique to Mark's gospel, chapter 4, 26 and 27, we pointed this out where he talks about the kingdom of God is like scattering seed on the ground and, uh, and you sleep and rise up the next day and it would sprout and grow. And yet he does not know how someone scattering the seed and that it grows and, and it's mysterious, right? It's mysterious. That's this same theme that we're finding in Mark of that there's a mystery to God's kingdom and the, here it would be the, the growth of God's kingdom. So there's a unique reference and then we're going to mention chapter 9 and verse 1 a little bit, a little bit later. But uh, let me get to here. This is unique in even though you have Matthew recording Jesus' statement on this occasion about, you know, cut off your hand and uh, cut off your foot, rather, pluck out your eye. Well, it's only in Mark's gospel in chapter 947 here where he says, for it's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes to be thrown into hell. Whereas in Matthew's account, it's um, enter into life. But there's an additional reference here in Mark where he's using the term kingdom of God for that. And then some of these other verses you, you, we, we find as well in Matthew and Luke. And so, uh, let the little children come to me, such, uh, such as these, that the kingdom of God belongs. And um, whoever does not receive the kingdom as a little child, chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, how hard it is. And this is a familiar one to us for those who have wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. There are the references as well in uh, Matthew and, and Luke. And I've added one here. After chapter, here you've got, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Very intriguing reference that I think can have more than one significance. We'll get to that in a moment. But to that, I have... Um, I've added this one here that wasn't included for some reason in his list, chapter 14 and verse uh, 
chapter 15, rather, and verse uh, 43. Whoops, I erased that. Chapter 15, there it is, in verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who also himself, uh, he was looking for the kingdom of God. So it's interesting to see these references here in Mark's gospel. And you can compare to what you find in the other gospels um, the, the familiar statement in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Sorry about that. The, let's see if I can get that back. The kingdom of God and His righteousness. Uh, because Mark doesn't have the, the Sermon on the Mountain recorded there. And this is important in the sense we're going to be uh, in the sense in which the kingdom arrived with Christ and even in his ministry. This statement that you don't find in Luke, but Matthew 12, 28, Luke 11, 20. Keep this in mind that Jesus said, if by the spirit of God, it's by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. We're familiar with uh, the Beatitudes, and as Luke records them, blessed are you who are poor. There's one of the Bible's yoo-hoos. Yoo-hoo. Uh, yoo-hoo. I always think of the, the drink, the, the watered-down chocolate milk type drink. Yoo-hoo. You who are poor, for yours is, yours is the kingdom of God, and etc. Well, uh, well, then notice this too, because uh, we're going to be talking about the future idea of the kingdom as well, that Luke 13, 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that's talking about hell, right? When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God. So uh, there's a future reference, and uh, this is an important one that we'll mention too later, even though uh, it's not in Mark's gospel, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, well, look, here it is, or there it is. For, in fact, the kingdom of God is among you and can be translated uh, in you. And then I mentioned the passage already, of course, from John. And then you can compare references. We find, of course, many others elsewhere in the New Testament, but especially in the letters of Paul, we find um, uh, several references there for you to consider where you have the kingdom spoken of as a present reality. Again, we're going to get to this. The kingdom of God is, is not food and drink. So that's speaking of it in the, in the present. The kingdom of God depends not on talk, but on, on power. 1 Corinthians 4, 4 and verse 20. But then the future idea in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I think that's talking about the eschatological kingdom. So all this is stuff we're going to get to here in a moment. Keep in mind, we can link once more the secrecy idea to the kingdom idea in Mark's gospel because notice he says in Mark 4, 11, Jesus tells them to you has been given the secret. I know we've called attention to this verse already when we were talking about that mystery motif, the secret of the kingdom of God, right? So there is a mystery of the kingdom that is hidden from some and revealed to others. Well, let's, let's continue and, and bring this to light again a little bit further here in a moment. Uh, but it's important to understand, the, again, the sense in which we're talking about the kingdom here. So it's the word, the term itself from the Greek word basileia, okay? Well, that's uh, what we call a, a cognate noun. And in this sense, it's derived from a term that can also be used as a verb, right? And we have uh, English words that way, but a good one to think of here is the word rain, because you can talk about the rain of king so-and-so, and that's a noun referring to his reign, and that, but then you can also use it as a verb that king so-and-so reigned from such-and-such such date and all of that. Well, the English noun kingdom does not have that same verbal usage. 
So it doesn't convey that sense of action like the word rain does, where you can use rain as a noun, but then it also can have that idea of the verb in it, where you're thinking of, a, of a, someone conducting his rule or his authority. You don't get that with the, uh, with the term kingdom, right? And I can give you some, some other, think of some other examples, for instance, Here's, a, here's another biblical one, and, and what I mean here is we don't say, we don't use the word kingdom as a verb. We don't say, well, God kingdoms over the world. We say God reigns or God rules over the world, but, you, but we just don't in English use kingdom as a verb. Like, for instance, faith. The word faith is from the same word for it, the, the same Greek cognate, it's a cognate rather of the Greek term believe, the verb believe. And so the noun form would be belief. So the verb is believe and then in English the noun form would be belief or faith. But the word faith doesn't have the sense of believing, like we can't say, well, I faith in God. We say, I believe in God, or I have faith in God, but we don't say, I faith you, when we want to say, I believe you, or I trust you. But you can do that with the word believe. You can say, I, I have belief, and I believe in God. You can just change the form slightly there, and you have both the noun and the, and the verb. And we have English words that, like the word love, right? The word love can be a noun, we speak of God's love, but then it can be a verb, love your neighbor. Or I often think of the word race, I don't know why that one always comes to my mind, but race, you can say the race is tomorrow at 1 p.m. And then you can say I race in races every weekend, I go, I, I race. So race is both a noun and a verb. It's funny, uh, by the way, to look at the nouns, just to, if I can just say in passing, this would be one of those fun things to talk about in class that, we're, that we always kind of kick around a little bit for a little bit of a break in our discussion. But um, think of the trend in our day to make verbs nouns. And sometimes it drives me nuts, like the word adult. <laughs> you know, until about 10 minutes ago, adult was just a noun, but we'll hear people saying, well, I just, I just can't adult today. Or they'll say, wow, adulting is hard. Coffee, even. Uh, people will say, well, you know, I coffee with her every, every Tuesday and Thursday morning. I coffee with you? Yeah, well, people are using words like that. And the noun Google now, of course, is a verb. You can, you, you know, we don't have to say, I'm going to look something up on Google. You just say, Google, I'm going to Google it. And I'm going to Google uh, this or that. eBay, the same way. Well, what are you going to do with that uh, piece of junk that you got there? Why don't you eBay it? Or you've maybe heard the expression, do you even lift, bro? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but some will. Do you even lift, bro? Well, I've heard this, when people are misusing language or abusing the, the King's English or uh, using terms incorrectly, they'll say, do you even language, bro? They'll talk about language like it's a verb. Well, interesting, we, don't, we have words like rain that can convey, back to what we were talking about here, that, that can convey both the, the noun the sense of a thing, but then also the sense of an action. And kingdom doesn't do that, and so it may be helpful to speak of instead the, the reign of God. The kingdom of God in Mark's gospel, and then in the New Testament, in light of all of this, what we're trying to say is it's, it's, it's not a place so much. It's not the place where God lives. It's not so much a physical space or an entity. Not a static location, but a dynamic activity. 
a dynamic activity. Well, what activity? What are we talking about? Well, we can say it this way, I think. The, the reign or kingdom of God, it's, it's a phenomenon that is whenever and wherever God is ruling, where God is reigning, where God's will is being done. And speak, speaking of that expression, just look at Matthew chapter 6 and these familiar words from the Sermon on the Mountain in what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus says, Our Father, verse 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, your kingdom come, your will be done. Now, Jesus isn't asking for two different things there. I think uh, what we have is Hebrew parallelism or poetic parallelism where you just say, this is common, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, in in the Psalms, in the poetic passages in the Hebrew Bible. And this is set out, notice, the way the ESV has it, in the form of poetry, in poetic verse. But notice this, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's just another way of saying your kingdom come. So, in other words, um, God's kingdom, God can be said to reign. God's kingdom can be said to be present, we can say it that way, when His will is taking place. You see that again? Your kingdom come, your will be done. So when God's will is being done, when God is accomplishing His will, His kingdom is present. And you can think of it in your own life. God is ruling your life when God's will in your life is taking place. So you can think of God's ruling as when what God wants to happen is taking place. And that's why we mentioned earlier, Luke 17, 21, that uh, Jesus said, well, don't say the kingdom of God is coming like you would see an army approaching and say, here, it's there, or no, it's over here. Where he says, no, the kingdom of God is in your midst. If that's the way it should be translated, then that means Christ is there in their midst and he is bringing the kingdom to them. That can be one way to understand it. Or it can be translated, and there's another dimension even of that. You can just think of the idea that God's kingdom, his, he, he is present wherever, in your midst, wherever his will is being done. But then if it's to be translated, the kingdom of, the kingdom of God is within you, again, it's that idea of his, his rule. Or think of this. Let me just slide in a couple, of, a couple extra verses here. Um, I just mentioned Luke 17, 21. But in Luke 10, in verse 9, Jesus said, well, when he sent, out, when he sent them out on the limited commission and he gave them authority to uh, power to heal the sick, and he said and, and announced that um, when go out and heal the sick and announce the kingdom of God has come to you. And then he said, if they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. But then in verse 11, he says in, uh, in Luke chapter 10, then in verse 11, he says, uh, but tell them, nevertheless, tell them this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. And then uh, chapter 11 and verse 20, we, we already mentioned that idea that if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then is the kingdom of God come unto you? Or if I, by the finger of God, actually Luke's account, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. So this, this idea of uh, God's reign, God's will being done. So when we come to Mark's gospel, what, what are we seeing then? Think of it in, the, in that light. Um, the nearness of God's reign, the earth, these are the things said about it. The nearness of God's reign is a, is a secret. We saw that a moment ago. That um, it's just the beginning of something that will grow into something vast when Jesus gives the parable of the seed in Mark 4, verses 30 through 32. 
That's where Jesus is talking about the, seed, the, the mustard seed, the smallest of seeds, and yet it grows uh, to be bigger than all the plants in the garden and uh, to a tree with branches where the birds of the air can nest and all of that. So it grows into something vast. With small beginnings, God's reign is, is spreading through, going to spread throughout the world. And when it does, it will happen in a mysterious way. That's uh, the passage we noted where um, you know not how. It's going to usher in with power, be ushered in with power. The kingdom of God will come with power, Jesus said. And that it's, impo that it's possible, rather, and in fact, it's imperative to enter into it. Jesus talks about how for some it's hard to enter in, but you need to become as a child if you're going to enter into the kingdom. So how do you do that? How do you actually enter into the kingdom? We can ask that question. Well, uh, by, by trusting this good news, right? When, when Mark's gospel begins and Jesus says, uh, the kingdom is near, the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe the good news. So when you believe the good news, when you change your heart and your life and you believe the good news and you live accordingly, then you are, in that sense, you are entering into the kingdom of God. And I, and I think thinking of the kingdom as the reign of God helps us understand a lot of passages as well, not just those that we already looked at there. And this class isn't turning out as short as I thought after all. But um, think, for example, of this familiar statement from Jesus. In, in Mark chapter 10, and you have a record of this, of course, in Matthew and Luke and the other synoptics as well. But in Mark chapter 10, when Jesus after he told the rich man to sell all that he had, give to the poor, come follow me, you'll have treasures in heaven and all that. And he went away sorrowful because he had much riches. And then when Jesus says in Mark 10, 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a, for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You see that right there in verse 25? And so again, it's not the idea of a so much of a place, or so much uh, of a of a of a space. Even it's the idea of being submissive to the will of God, allowing God's will to be done in your life, because you're not trusting in Him and acknowledging your need for Him. You're taking comfort and, and trust in your, in your riches and in your money. And so in that way, the reign of God, it's hard for God's reign to be accomplished in a person like that. All right, so what does it mean then for, for Jesus to say, as he does in the beginning of Mark's gospel, and Mark calls this the, the, the good news here, that the kingdom of God, I'm sorry, the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark 1, 15. That expression, at hand, the, the term here it can, can mean has come near. Well, in what way has the kingdom of God, how could it be said to have now come near? I think in this sense that it's the idea that the time for which the people of God have been waiting for all of these centuries, the time has finally come for God's will to be uh, accomplished, or at least for now, for it to begin to be accomplished. Well, God's will in what sense? I think in, in bringing about our salvation and in making for Himself a people who will be His new covenant people who will submit to Him, from drawing from all men, from all nations on the face of the earth. This is the idea that God is finally beginning to accomplish this, bring it to pass, uh, bring it to pass rather. So what God has promised and what He has predicted through the prophets, what God wants to happen in bringing salvation to men and bringing together a people 
where his rule will be manifested. What God has promised and is wanting to happen is about to take place and in, and in fact has already begun to take place in the appearance of Christ and in now in the ministry and in the work of Christ. And here's something exciting to uh, contemplate, that this, this whole idea of the nearness of God's reign or God's kingdom in Mark, it's seen not as much in the teaching of Jesus as in the deeds of Jesus. You remember we pointed out Matthew adds huge blocks of teaching from Jesus. So you have these sermons that are interspersed throughout Matthew's narrative where you don't find that as much in Mark. Mark, Mark his account is moving, it's, it's fast-paced, and he's telling us more about who Jesus is by what he does more than by what he teaches. He's not giving us as much of what he teaches. He's giving us more of what Jesus does. And so you're seeing how when Jesus announces, I'm here and the reign of God now is here in your midst, it's, it's now at hand, he then begins to demonstrate that by his works in, in his healings, in his exorcisms especially. We'll talk about under Christology, his authority over the demonic forces. In the other miracles that he does as well, you're seeing demons. Well, what is that showing us? That demons, all of the uh, demonic forces and the disease and the catastrophic forces of nature in Jesus, they are now being vanquished with the coming of Christ now in the world, that he is the one who has the power to vanquish these forces. Really, ultimately, he's coming to deal with the forces of evil. He's showing us, Mark is showing us how Jesus is the one that has the power and the authority from God to overcome the force, the forces of evil, the results of sin and evil in the world. All of this, these catastrophic events, all of the disease and the, and the, and the demons' power and all of that are evidences of the influence of sin. But that now, in Christ, uh, we have the one who can vanquish that and give us victory over sin. This is the good news. A couple other aspects of God's reign, the idea of it coming near in Jesus. Think of how it results in, and I like the way Powell words this, in an inbreaking of purity. All right, what, what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at this with me. Think of uh, leprosy, for example. In the case of leprosy, and then in Jesus, Mark begins his gospel right there near the beginning telling us about uh, quite a moving episode where Jesus cleanses this leper by touching him. Now, when we think of a leper, we know that leprosy is one of those diseases where, and I'm trying to show that with these little guys here, um, where the uncleanness is passed on by contact so that if you come into contact with what is unclean, that uncleanness is transferred, right? That's a concept that's brought out in Leviticus and that we find in the, in, under the Mosaic Covenant and in the priestly system and the idea of needing to be cleansed from impurities and all of that. Well, this, this whole idea of holiness, that uncleanness can be, can be transferred so that uh, this guy he comes in contact with a leper, then that uncleanness is transferred to him. But think about now what happens with Jesus, right? With Jesus, the, Jesus is perfect in holiness and in purity. And when he comes into contact with leprosy, what, what happens there? The uncleanness, when he touches the man, the man's uncleanness cannot transfer to Jesus. And so instead, it works in the opposite direction, right? Where the purity of Christ, the uh, holiness of Christ then, 
is passed on or its power results in making that man pure from his uncleanness. Fascinating to look at these things, isn't it? But it also has, uh, it has ethical in implications, God's reign coming near in Christ. What, think of all that this implies. For example, we're seeing uh, a call to God's ideal will. Again, if we're thinking of the kingdom of God, meaning where God's will is done, your kingdom come, your will be done, that idea that we've already talked about. Well, look at, for example, when it comes to the matter of marriage and divorce. When they asked Jesus about this in Mark chapter 10, and uh, Jesus explains that, well, God allowed divorce under the old covenant, but uh, notice, let's, uh, let me clear the way so I can bring up this text here. Um, Jesus says that God allowed divorce, Mark 10 and verse 5, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then this, this important statement then, what therefore God has joined together, what therefore, I'm sorry, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, in Mark's account, the way this is explained then is the disciples ask him about the issue in the house. And in Matthew's account, Jesus tells them right out, this is what it means. In Matthew's account, the disciples ask him about it, and verse 11, he says, well, this is what this means here. This is what this means. Verse 11, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Well, why is this? Because God's will is being enjoined. God's kingdom has arrived. And it's not God's will, when we enter into a marriage covenant, it is not the will of God that we break that covenant. And so where God's will is being accomplished, divorce isn't allowed. And when I'm submitting to the rule of God, when I'm submitting to the reign of God over me, right? Um, in those cases, or in that case, if God is ruling my life, um, I, I won't seek divorce. I, I, where God's will is being done, there isn't a, a desire to break a covenant when God says you make this covenant and you need to keep this covenant and it's a lifelong covenant. When God's will is being accomplished, there's no need to allow for divorce. You see the idea? So the reign of God Let's return to this idea I mentioned earlier, we would come back to it. It is both a present reality, but it's a future hope. This is the already not yet idea of the kingdom that we've already talked about when we looked at, um, when we looked at I think, especially Luke. And in Mark, the emphasis is clearly on the already idea. The emphasis is clearly here. On, on the present reality. Here are some, some references to, to consider, uh, for example. You can think of, again, the reign of God as breaking through now and coming near in the presence of Christ as he begins his ministry, chapter 115, when he begins to preach the gospel, the kingdom of God is at hand, he said, or it has now come near. And that idea of coming near, we could add to what we said earlier about the dimensions of meaning in that. It could be intentionally, intentionally ambiguous because it could mean it's near in the sense of time that we're, okay, Jesus has come, the kingdom is, has come near, meaning it's about to be experienced, it's about to become a present reality. It could be in the sense of time or in the sense of, of the person of Jesus. Jesus has, in his presence, brought it near in space and uh, in, in actual space and time itself. Then in the teaching of 
of the parables, right? In chapter 4, we see Jesus, uh, the parables we've already mentioned where he talks about the kingdom of God, but uh, we find um, that Jesus is talking about what life is like in the kingdom and what the impact of the kingdom is like. Now here, here's one, chapter 9 and verse 1, you're going to see the kingdom come with power. And then we've, we mentioned chapter 10 and verse 15 that we have to be willing to receive the kingdom as a little child. Well, let's look at this chapter 9 and verse 1 and think about this for a second. And this is where Jesus talks about here, truly I say to you, and he's talking about when when he comes in glory with his angels, verse 38. But, and, and that's the future, I think, the culmination of and the final consummation of his kingdom when he, when he comes at the end of time. But notice here he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they, they're going to see, I'm sorry, they're going to see the kingdom of God come with power. They're not going to taste the death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come. And has come, in fact, uh, with power. So clearly there is some sense in which the kingdom has now come. Those of our religious friends who are always thinking of the kingdom of God as something yet future, and that Jesus is going to come and set up God's kingdom on earth because he didn't establish it when he came the first time, that dispensational premillennialist idea. Uh, Jesus here says the kingdom is going to come in the lifetime of those who were there. So this will of God is going to be accomplished, and his reign is going to be experienced in a special way, and this is going to come when His power is manifested, and I think He's alluding to the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. It's going to happen in their lifetime. But when we think of future references to the kingdom, um, you have some intriguing passages here, 1425. I put a question mark by this. This is when Jesus is eating the Passover meal with the disciples, and he does what we call instituting the Lord's Supper when he takes the bread and the cup and tells them to do it in remembrance of him. But that's when he says, I won't take of this fruit of the vine. I won't partake of this again until I partake anew with you in the kingdom, in the kingdom. Well, I think the reason I put a question mark there is I think that this could be... Um, both a future reference, but also something we experience now when we take the supper in his kingdom now, when we come together as his church and worship on the first day of the week. Or look at, look at chapter 13, verses 26 through 32 here in the apocalypse, apocalypse the little apocalypse it's called here, uh, Jesus' apocalyptic discourse that we haven't really addressed yet in Mark's Gospel, and that this is often taken to be referring to the coming of Christ at the end of time, yet, so we, we list it here as, as something future, and yet, let's go back and look at it. You can see when you first read this, it seems like Jesus is pointing ahead, even though he's talking about signs of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. He then goes on to say in chapter 13, beginning in verse 34 here, in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is all apocalyptic language to talk about. Um, it's, it's a way of emphasizing the drama of God stepping in and making His presence felt in the affairs of men, intervening in time to actualize His will, as we said earlier. So verse 26, this isn't to be understood literally as stars are going to actually fall from heaven or that they actually did when Jerusalem was destroyed. But in verse 26, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Now that could be His coming in judgment on Jerusalem. But this is a hard one to think is just talking about the destruction of Jerusalem because verse 27 says, then He will send out the angels and gather His elect from the four winds of uh, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. 
Uh, and notice, though, he does go on to say that this generation will, this generation will not pass away down here in verse 30 until all these things take place, until all these things happen. So this, I'm sorry, whoops, this um, makes us, I just deleted everything on the screen. I hope it didn't disappear for you. So this is why we, we may think, well, this must all be talking about what happens in the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, yet, I think the destruction of Jerusalem, though, is to be understood as typological or a type of the Lord's final coming in judgment. So I think you have both ideas here. Because notice he talks about when, when the Son of Man comes and then later in John, just a, a chapter later, in Mark rather, Mark 14, when he's on trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin and the high priest in verse 61 insists that he tell them. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Wow, look at this. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. We're going to talk about that and how that relates to Daniel's prophecy from Daniel chapter 7. But here again, this seems to be pointing to something that has not yet happened and about the Lord's final coming at the end of time. But let's return to our chart. Though those may be what we call eschatological, references to the eschatological phase of the kingdom, that is the final things at the end of time, when the kingdom, when we finally have the consummation of the kingdom. But I think though even those passages in Mark's gospel can carry the idea of, can still have an element of things that are, are present now that happened in the coming of Christ, for example, in judgment on Jerusalem, but then in his coming on Pentecost and the establishment of the, the church. Uh, certainly the kingdom of God is not limited to that, but those, those are things where, you know, we might consider there is a hint of the present idea in these passages as well, so that clearly uh, even though, even though, ultimately the we know that there the kingdom has yet to be consummated, but still the emphasis in Mark's gospel is on the present reign, and so that's the idea in which we have this um, uh, this I, this that's the idea in which we have the reign of God. Uh, at hand or near in Jesus' time and then already being experienced. And we look for the ultimate consummation of God's kingdom or rule with the final coming of Christ at the end of time. But so much for a late class. We're almost done here. So much for a short class, rather. We're almost done here. We're running late. Let me hurry and finish. What we want to remember, though, especially, is that Mark is showing us that in some mysterious way that, that Mark does not explain, and that will be left more for Paul, the, who's more of a the, the theologian, that will be left f to be explained in the, in the Didache. This is the kerygma, the proclamation of the church, but later in the teaching where we'll find it explained more in the epistles. Um, it's, it's not explained by Mark, but in some mysterious way, not just in Jesus' teaching, not just in his miracles, but Jesus is going to accomplish God's will in what happens on the cross. What happens on the cross. When in Mark 10, 45, he said uh, he's going to give his life a ransom for many. Somehow in giving his life, as a ransom to bear the punishment for our sins and to satisfy the wrath of God, that this is making possible the reign of God, the rule of God. God's will is being accomplished.
even when it appears to be the most unlikely moment in all of history on the cross, when it appears to be the most powerful evidence that God's will is not being accomplished, that you have this innocent, perfect man being crucified, being murdered in this extreme moment of grotesque injustice, even in that, God's will is being accomplished. So much so that Jesus, you remember when, when Peter says, no, Lord, we, we won't let that happen. In Mark chapter 8, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. It, so much so is God's will accomplished in the cross that Jesus rejects as satanic anything opposed to that, anything that would deter that, anything that would even try to stand in the way of that. And so Mark shows us that in Jesus' suffering on the cross, God's will, God's reign, God's kingdom is coming near and, in fact, is about to become a reality in our lives. And that's what we can now have in our lives because of what Jesus did on the cross and, and his resurrection from the dead. Uh, God's kingdom, God's rule is already established. It was already breaking into the world in the coming of Christ and in the ministry of Christ. And it will be consummated when our Lord Jesus Christ returns again from heaven. We need to be wait, waiting for and watching for that great day. Okay, well, we are at almost 57 minutes here. I apologize for another long class. I should know better than to think I would go short, but <laughs> we're finished with themes and theology then, and we're going to go ahead and, and move on to look at, Lord willing, next time we'll look at the Christology of Mark's Gospel, and then we'll be finished, and then all we'll have left is John. So yes, finally after these many months, we'll be, we'll be bringing things to a close in our final section. For now, as always, peace to you, my good friends and brothers. May God's grace continue upon you. I look forward, Lord willing, to being together again soon. God bless you.